Glenn. Hi, how's everyone doing? All right. Uh, Bill, could you put me up on screen, please? Or on camera, rather? Uh, I do apologize for the delay. We're having a, a couple of technical hiccups here at Village Hall. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, Madam Co-Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, we're ready to go. Um, as soon as you like, thank you um, for your patience. Yeah, we're having just a little trouble, just a little trouble hearing you, Glenn, that's all. Oh, give me uh, just one moment here. That's better, a little better. We can always, um, we're having a little bit of audio trouble, so if you keep having trouble hearing me, we can try to switch it around. That's better, okay. Shall we start? Whenever you're ready, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to call to order uh, the Village of Lake Bluff Sustainability and Community Enhancement Ad Hoc Committee for Thursday, April 15th. May I have a roll call, please? Certainly, Member Bishop. Here. Member Sorensen. Here. Member Twitchell. Present. Okay, uh, Co-Chair Perrier. Present. And Co-Chair Renner. Here. You have a quorum. Okay, great. Um, first up on the agenda is a consideration from the August 25th, 2020, remember that year? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sustainability and Community uh, Meeting in uh, Meeting Minutes. Do we have any comments, changes, addendums? No, I think that was Allie's first meeting though, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. 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 <laughs> All right. Everybody. Okay, uh, Glenn, you wanna call the roll call? Uh, or voice vote, uh, it'll have to be all motions this evening. I should mention um, because of COVID-19 will have to be by roll call. Um, with that said, okay. um, Member Bishop? Yes. Member Sorensen? Yes. Member Twitchell? Yes. Co-Chair Purrier? Yes. And Co-Chair Renner? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Um, I had to read the next one. I'm not sure if anyone else is online, but we uh, the next is non-agenda items. We allow 15 minutes for anyone to speak on an item that is not currently on the agenda. Glenn, do we have anyone else online? I don't see anyone. Uh, we do have uh, three um, individuals joining us from the public. Um, so if you're here to comment on something not on tonight's agenda, you can use um, the raise hand button down at the bottom of the screen. We're happy to give you the opportunity to speak. Um, otherwise, we um, will continue on. And if you are speaking, want to speak about the agenda, we will allow you to, to speak during those items. So, All right. Um, so, Glenn, why don't you take us on to uh, tonight's general business? Certainly. So the um, biggest item of uh, substantive item of business, aside from, uh, you know, we'll talk about a litany of things during staff report, uh, but the primary item on your agenda tonight is a backyard chicken application um, at 312, excuse me, East Scranton Avenue, uh, and that's Miss Fowler, the Fowler family. Um, so by way of introduction, before we get into this application, um, a few weeks, months, earlier this year, I guess is the best way of describing it. Um, the village board made permanent, or at least indefinite, if you would, um, the backyard chicken um, pilot program, right? So the, the text of that, um, the text we're working with isn't, hasn't been codified yet, 
Um, you know, again, it takes a little bit. We group these up to work into the village code, um, but it looks a lot like your um, pilot program. Again, just bearing in mind that it's um, indefinite now. Um, so a couple of tweaks I would note. One is that, you know, the, the lot size strict restrictions are no longer present. Um, another would be that the um, <clears throat> a renewal application doesn't continue to require, um, you know, that the applicant come back before you. I mean, that's certainly um, possible. But again, as the pilot is concluded, as there wasn't, you know, not necessarily a need to continue to gather information, um, didn't necessarily want to keep that requirement in there. Um, I think those are the most uh, important points. Again, there's still this requirement that a new applicant um, is reviewed by this commission that you make a recommendation um, before they get a license. Um, and then many of the other standards apply, again, as far as um, the number of chickens, not having roosters, um, all of these things that were made in the pilot program um, to make sure that these um, activities didn't cause a nuisance, anything like that. So. Um, before I get into the application itself, I'm happy to answer any uh, any questions. Okay. Um, so the application you have before you tonight, I know um, that Ms. Fowler is here to speak with you. Again, she's just moving into 312 East Scranton, has that property under contract. Um, the application materials you have in your packet uh, describe the application. I'll also note... Um, and we'll come back to this perhaps after Ms. Fowler's presentation when we go into public comment uh, that we've received some correspondence um, from neighbors. Certainly I've fielded a few phone calls uh, and then I have uh, a letter here, um, the same as an email you received um, in the packet uh, signed by um, seven individuals um, that I received today. So I'll put that on camera a little later. Um, I will, we will give Ms. Uh, Fowler the ability to speak for now. And uh, I actually apologize, I'll have to run <laughs> into the other room to do that, so I'll be right back with you. Technical difficulties, um, a favorite here in COVID times. Please excuse me. Hello. Hello. I'm not sure where my audio is. <laughs> Maybe I don't have audio. Um, I we did can hear you. together a little. We okay. can hear you. Can hear you. Yeah. Can't see you. <laughs> Um, I did put together like a little presentation. I read through all of the letters that um, were in the notes. Um, so I don't know if I can, I think I can share my screen if that's okay. Oh, I can't. Oh, uh, you can now. Okay. Okay, so um, my chicken application, um, and Glenn and I were joking about the last name also being re chicken related, so <laughs> is that. But um, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to apply. Um, the pilot program was a big thing, which was why we were interested in um, moving to Lake Bluff. And I also really appreciate the letters from the neighbors. Like I, it's very important to me to be a good neighbor and I appreciate knowing specific concerns so we can address each one of those. 
um, adequately. Um, we had concerns too, five years ago, we decided to keep chickens and we researched them for a full year just to make sure that we were ready. Um, and in the research, we realized that taking care of chickens properly eliminates a lot of the concerns um, that I saw in the letters and even concerns that I had. Um, they um, unexpectedly benefited our yard with um, chemical pre free pest reduction as they love to eat ticks and mosquitoes and other garden pests. Um, we've often, you know, had them in the garden, like the vegetable garden, if we've had slugs or something and they eat all of those up and then we put them back. Um, but they also replenish soil. My neighbor um, asked for, you know, fertilizer for her garden a lot and she loves getting that. Um, not that anyone else needs to have it, but it's just an unexpected benefit that we've found. Um, and so I feel more comfortable with the kids being in the yard with less bugs and ticks and things like that and my pets as well. Um, I saw that someone was concerned about the location of the coop and we were trying to decide looking at like maps and things. So last week we were able to visit the site and kind of review that, um, which I know one of the neighbors was concerned about the prior location being further west. So um, after being at the site, you know, we saw that probably butting up against the garage was a better location. Um, that way it's more hidden from view. And then um, it looks like from the, the back of the yard, it would look more like just a shed. Um, this is kind of the look that we're hoping for with the coop and the run. We want to utilize like flower beds around it and flowering vines and vegetables that border the run, um, which will help make it more beautiful. And then the chickens also aid in the chemical free garden pest control. Um, this is kind of more of the plans that we were, um, after some more research, wanting to utilize. Um, you can see from the front, it looks um, kind of like a screened porch. I didn't, I wasn't able to get a good picture of like what, what it would look like on the back, but you can see from the interior rear photo, the back of the coop would just be solid. So the, the yard behind me would just have kind of a shed to look at instead of chickens. Um, the pros of this model after, you know, the years that we have had chickens is that it's very predator proof. Um, there's hardware cloth and stone that all go all around the bottom, all around the top, you know, up on the roof. Um, so no predators are able to come in. Um, and it also helps with smell and moisture repelling because the roof of the run keeps water out. The floor is raised and there's sand. So any kind of water or moisture from excrement can you know, be pulled away. And then there's fine wood chips on the floor of the coop that help with that too. Um, also, it's mice proof, so it does not attract the mice. If they can't come in, they're gonna go somewhere else. Um, regarding the smell, um, definitely regular cleaning is vital. Um, we do remove the chicken excrement frequently, but um, similar to other like noxious nature smells, um, removing the moisture as soon as possible helps as well. So we utilize all these different systems to keep out or remove moisture. Um, like I said, like the roof for the sand and fine wood chips and the raised floor, all of that helps the moisture to leave as soon as possible. And then we also try to keep their diet and digest digestion systems very healthy with a very high quality grain. We do enzyme supplements and fresh water just to keep them as healthy as possible. And that definitely helps with the smell. Um, and then the other issue was regarding predators, which was a huge concern of mine too. Um, I had an outdoor cat who was very adventurous and I was worried, you know, if the chickens are there, something else might be there too. So um, we've utilized these really small, um, it doesn't have a measurement here, but they're like, two inches by three inch um, systems. They're very dim red lights and they blink at random um, and they kind of mimic the eyes of like a larger predator than the animal or another large animal. Um, we hang them like two, two and a half feet above ground level. Um, and that seems to have kept a lot of animals out of our yard that have definitely visited other neighbors yards, like just as you know, and big animals come through sometimes. And one of my neighbors also told me one morning, he said, I was sitting out late last night. I saw a fox like come through my yard and it, I saw it start to go over to yours. And then it saw, you know, the blinking lights and it took off running, it was out of there. And he's like, I thought, you know, that blinking thing was 
stupid until I saw that. So he was a big hunter and he thought that was really interesting and that it worked. Um, the other thing is that the bottom border of the coop is again, stone and that hardware cloth. So it keeps things out. You know, if something comes by like a raccoon or whatever, and they can't get in, they're going to go somewhere else and move along. Um, and there will not be, I found that they don't visit. And I always check my yard too, like for tracks. Um, and I've really only seen squirrels that are around at all. Um, and then the final thing was noise and in all my research too, and I found that it's true over the last four years, that a happy chicken is a quiet chicken. Um, when they're clean, they're happy and they're quiet. When they're safe, they feel safe, they're happy and quiet. And when they're healthy, they're happy and quiet. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And um, let me know if there's any other questions too. I'm happy to answer anything. Thank you. Oh, there does I am. the, does, does the uh, committee have any questions or comments? I do. I um, first of all really appreciate the, um, the detail with which you've presented your materials, Heather. They're um, they're very thorough, and um, that's nice to see. I love the design and the hardware cloths, and you know you're you're covering um, a lot of bases um, that we. This is probably the most thorough application or and, and the needed <laughs> together application we've received. Um, and um, my other my question is um, on the schematic that you provided, um, I believe um, between uh, your new home and the homes that are directly north of you, it looks to me like those are all garages in the backyard. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. So, um, so there's your garages and there's fences. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this is moving, uh, sorry. This is moving your existing chickens, not, you, you're not getting new chickens? Correct. Yes. They're, we have chickens. They're two years old. Um, that's why I did the, the application so early because they they're alive and existing now so not like a theoretical thing that we're thinking we want to do yeah anybody else with the movement of the um from from your first pictures to your new position mm -hmm. near the garage are you still able to um, uh, cover all of the needed setbacks? Yes, I, I was confused with the setbacks um, because I saw like older rules. What are the exact setbacks just to refresh my memory? It needs to be away from the homes, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's still the same distance from all of the homes. I believe it's a little bit further. I had them in, like, I thought they would be good, in, like, in that little nook in the original application, but then when we went and looked at, look, looked at it, I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's not going to work, so. And I'm open, you know, like, I'm not married to any idea of this is where it has to be. You know, I want, like I said, I want to be a good neighbor, and I don't want them to be, you know, staring at, <laughs> staring at my chicken coop, so I understand that, and so, you know, that's why we wanted to move it and tuck it underneath the, the garage a little bit more. Thank you. To, uh, to answer your question, so there are really uh, two setbacks um, that apply. Uh, the first is that the, the, the coop, the enclosure, anything like that can't be within um, 10 feet of any occupied residence other than that of the licensee. Um, the second, ordinarily applicable within the village, you know, if you're building a coop that's an accessory structure, you'd have to follow the accessory structure setbacks. Um, in, this, in this district, I believe that's five feet. Um, so yeah, the, uh, it's your, five feet from everything. Your yard is the yard is completely fenced. Um, it is not completely fenced. It is partially fenced. Um, I'm open to having it completely fenced, but I'm also not planning on having the chickens running around the yard. 
Um, I've done that before and it was great, but um, the chickens that we have right now have been raised more enclosed. Um, okay. we, we had a few disappear by hawk um, when they were running around the yard and I don't, that's, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do that again. So they stay in their enclosure. Um, and, and I'm just going to say, Brian, just for what it's worth, um, you know, the chickens on the North Avenue chickens um, are not in a fully fenced yard, just for what that's worth. And um, when they do, when they are out of the enclosure, they're uh, supervised for that exact reason that Heather brought up so that, you know, and and we have had a hawk, you know, in the neighborhood, very close, watching to see what happens. But chickens are pretty resourceful, especially mm -hmm. in downtown Lake Bluff. They don't really, <laughs> well, it's not like having a little bit more land where they have a lot of places to, I mean, they're out in a lot of grass. This is a, mm -hmm. it's a little harder to get at them here. Yeah. Glenn, could you uh, refresh our memory for the applications that we've had for chickens, the people in the village who've had chickens? Um, have we had any significant complaints from neighbors after after the fact? No, sir. Okay. And the even though we don't no longer, because it's no longer a pilot program, Although we no longer require them to appear before the board, there is there is a time frame on the permit renewal, correct? Yes. So it would um, the licenses have to be renewed um, annually, on or before March first. Uh, there's there's no fee for doing that. Um, we just in part because there's a limit on the number of licenses. We're just trying to make sure that people pulling licenses are continuing to um, engage in that activity. And there are factors to approving that renewal, correct? Uh, or there can be considerations for whether to approve or deny that renewal? Yes. So um, there are certain conditions under which we can require an inspection. So um, for sure, we'll go out and inspect it before we give them uh, a licensee their first license. Um, after that, you know, we can um, require it as a condition of renewal. We can. Um, inspect it one or more times where they've been cited for a code violation relating to animal keeping um, or again if we think there's probable cause to think that these criteria the chicken license program criteria are being violated um, again we've got the right to request a reasonable inspection and, and go in and confirm that what if what if significant complaints have occurred during that year before the renewal are you saying to to date we've had no significant complaints of? Uh, I know, but I, I'm remembering, and it may. I just want to make sure cause I may have forgotten. But in the original criteria for renewals, there was a consideration of neighbor complaints such as noise, smells, uh, in in that. And I can't remember if, if the current rules, when you renew at a year, if there's been a, a notable concerns or complaints that the village has investigated, whether that is a factor in, in approving the renewal. Yes, so I'll check while we're speaking. I don't think, I'm fairly sure these provisions haven't changed. I mean, the idea of, you know, um, I mean, when we're talking about probable cause, certainly a neighbor complaining would be, um, you know, probable cause. But of course, you know, this is still, um, you know, this is a license and people are agreeing to certain things when they get a license. Um, but, you know, it's still uh, mm -hmm. someone's home and, and someone's residence. And so we need to, we need a little bit more of a, a threshold to, to go on their property. So that you're aware, there's a comment in the Q&A, if you haven't seen it, that says from an Alex Peck, we live across the street at 305 East Grand and pledge our support of the chicken. Fowler Thank you. And Thank you. Peck. Fowler and Peck, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, we can't get by without a pun here. Yeah. I was going to keep my composure it be, before. It would be an exceptional day if we did. 
Um, well, I, I mean, I can say that, you know, on North Avenue, we have somewhere between 25 and 35 people walking by the chickens on a any given sunny day. Actually, during COVID, it was probably, you know, between 75 and 80 people on a given day. And uh, to the point that Brian asked, you know, have we had complaints? The answer has been no. Um, it's, oh, hi, Gwen. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the neighbor who was concerned that they would see it from all different angles. And Heather, maybe you've already addressed that by relocating it. But at the same time, someone could build a garden shed, right? Um, or any other um, ancillary structure that, again, a neighbor would see and would be fully um, within our ordinances as well, right? It's not different because it's a chicken shed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if that's a question, yes, that's that's correct. Um, that same uh, setback would apply to a garden shed, a uh, chicken enclosure, many other types of structures. Um, it could be built, I believe, to a maximum height of 17 feet, uh, again, five feet off the property line. Um, you'd have to, depending on the situation, if it was very tall, you might have to move it a bit more interior to the lot. But yes, garages, anything like that. Not going to be 17 feet tall, though. Is it, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> no. Wow. I was like, wow, 17 feet. Like, <laughs> that would be huge. More than six chickens to justify the yeah. <laughs> 17 mm -hmm. foot chicken coop. Yeah, and I also wanted to say, Heather, I really appreciated that you want to sort of incorporate it around your landscaping to sort of buffer it and um, climbing, you know, whatever, some trees nearby or shrubs or um, climbing vines is very um, thoughtful. Um, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, again, like, I want to be a good neighbor and um, I totally understand not wanting to look at ugly things out my window. Um, I also do not want to look at ugly things out my window. So um, my husband was like, yeah, I was like, don't worry, I'll put vines on it. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I want to do like natural stuff. I mean, I just, you know, the chickens are awesome for taking care of pests and things. And I like everything to, you know, work together as a system. I just like to add that um, as far as being one of the 80 people that walk by on North Avenue on practically a daily basis, um, I've tried to see the chickens or I've tried to hear the chickens. Um, I've never smelled the chickens. Right. And um, so they're there. They're always there. But when I walk by the house, there's no indication that there are chickens in the yard ever. I, you know, I, on occasion, I think they get a little anxious about laying, you know, and they, you can sometimes know that they're having a problem, but not a problem, but they're, they're vocal about what they're doing. But it's not, I mean, this morning I, I took a video of my backyard and I heard dogs barking, birds singing, and no chickens speaking. So, you know. It's a happy yeah, we've, yeah, we've had chickens on and off across the street from me on Lincoln Avenue. And I can say only once, uh, probably at 6.30 in the morning, I was walking my dog and I walked right past the fence. I could hear a little quiet clucking and that was it. Um, it's, there's been no, no substantial smell, no substantial. I, I wouldn't have noticed that they were in there. And... Um, Certainly one of the reasons we banned uh, in the regulations roosters is the chickens themselves are normally very mild compared to others. I have had complaints about my new dog barking. <laughs> um, if there's, do we have any other questions from the committee? If not, I'd like to certainly give anyone online uh, an opportunity to post questions or to talk, uh, Glenn, however that works. Certainly. Um, so we, we do have one other um, person in the audience. I'm not sure if they'd like to speak or not. Again, if you, you'd like to speak, you can hit raise hand there at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, uh, again, I did note um, at the start that we did receive, uh, we received an email saying that there would be a letter dropped off at Village Hall. So I'm, I'm, looks like this letter I have here um, is the same in content, um, but I did just want to share um, the, the signing page on that um, just to make sure um, that you guys have seen these signatures, seen in the record. Again, the, um, the text of this letter um, without these signatures was included in your packet, and this was in my inbox today. So I apologize we weren't able to circulate that, but wanted um, to share that. Um, our one... Yeah, there you go, Glenn. Yeah, our, uh, our one um, watcher uh, named Elzin said, uh, as a Lake Bluff resident several blocks from Heather's new home and a friend who has seen her current coop and chickens at her residence now, I can vouch for her responsible care for her hens and her sincere concern for her neighbors and fully support her application. Um, now I note they, you know, they didn't participate on this evening. I, I don't have the, the names of each of them, but certainly I did receive a few calls um, opposed to this application over the last um, few days. Uh, in each case, I encouraged them to submit um, something in writing or to um, appear before you this evening. Okay, um, doesn't look like we have anyone else who'd like to speak. Um, um, if you do, still raise your hand. Uh, I'll point out that Glenn pointed out how the procedure for uh, approval or denial of this go, can go forward. Glenn, you had put that together. We we can do a we can do the straight up or down vote. We can approve with conditions. There's a little bit of flexibility there, right, Glenn? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. So I would um, I'd clarify that based on what we're hearing here, if you were just to make a straight um, recommendation of approval you know we'd expect that um, approval reflects the site plan you have in your packet um, if there was a desire that um, Ms. Fowler construct a different site plan you know say something closer to the structure of the garage I know there was some discussion of that um, but would just uh, suggest that you be clear if it's not the site plan that was in the packet um, would suggest you be clear about what we're recommending approval of um, in that motion If that answers your question. Yeah, the only thing that I that I would put out to the committee just for consideration, um, we we have the yearly renewal during the pilot program. We required a meeting before the board, um, so that is would be an option you could consider. The committee could have asking for a them to appear before the board any year. Uh, should there be, have been any complaints or issues? or we can just allow the administrative renewal of the process should there have been any complaints to go through without because we're now no longer in the pilot program i'm just throwing that out there for the committee to consider are you ready for a motion brian i am okay well i'd be can i move can i make a movement there glenn i can can i Yeah, you can make a motion. Okay. All right. I move that we accept the proposal um, of uh, Heather Fowler for her six chickens to move to Lake Bluff proper. Um, and uh, I would include the location to be closer to her garage that she presented to us. Um, and I do not feel it's necessary for her to come back to the board next year i mean if they if they're complaints then administratively they'll deal with that okay do i have a second second okay can i get a roll call <clears throat> certainly or, or are there any other secondary motions before we go to roll call if not we'll go to roll call. okay okay member bishop Aye. Member Sorensen. Aye. Member Twishel. Aye. Uh, Co-Chair Perrier. Aye. And Co-Chair Renner. Aye. 
the motion carries. Bring the Thank, you. To Lake Bluff. Thank you so much. My kids will be very happy. <laughs> I already warned them. <laughs> so, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Okay. Hey, Glenn. Yeah, so um, for those of you who were on for this, you don't need to stay on for the remainder unless you're interested in hearing. Um, we welcome that. Uh, but I think uh, next up is the village staff report, Glenn. Sure. So uh, I'm happy to talk about any specific items. Uh, just to to be brief, maybe conserve our time. You know, just we we gave you a staff report that has some updates about various. Um, work going on in the village um, surrounding the sustainability plan, this committee's sustainability goals uh, adopted by the village board. Um, so commercial recycling, um, education about our compost program, um, online renewals for vehicle stickers, which I know um, I had a chance to look at that today and it looks to be right about uh, half or greater, which is pretty good adoption of that. Um, um, our, I should say our renewing online um, electrical aggregation, uh, again, very encouraging results there that I hope um, we can share soon. We're still in negotiation on that as well as with our commercial trash franchise. Um, some stormwater information, some capital improvements around storm sewers, uh, crosswalks, bicycle racks, and more walkability improvements. Um, again, I know it's it's been a, a bit since this group met, but um, I hope uh, I hope we've um, have made good progress uh, in a lot of ways since that time. So I'm happy to answer questions about uh, any of those items or um, anything else um, that the commissioners would like to bring up. When is the uh, final approval of the new um, garbage and uh, recycling contract? Sure. So we don't have a date for final approval yet. Um, I'll, I'll tell your coach, Renner, okay. probably. I should mention for everyone that Co-Chair Renner also s serves on the selection committee for that franchise. Um, we've been in negotiating negotiating with um, proposers as recently as 2:30 today, um, and so I think uh, Mr. Mr. Renner, Co-Chair Renner, excuse me, you'll hear personally about that soon. Um, but I I certainly hope we're getting close to a deal. Um, I think it's some pretty. Um, uh, probably best not to go into the details, but some meaty topics up for negotiation, but certainly um, I think very aggressive pricing we've seen from the proposers and um, most of them will deliver um, uh, something that keeps with the specification you know, we saw, it, which has, um, it's, it's really good recycling, really good composting service builds on the strengths um, that the village has. Um, I know one of our, um, Counterparties today said that um, I hope I'm quoting him right. That uh, the village has many things other towns are still trying to negotiate to get in their contracts. Um, and so I like to think that we we have a good model, and we're going to keep building on it in this next um, this next award. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fantastic. Obviously, we can't get into all the details because final final selection of contract are still open, but. Um, the thing we've talked about on the committee for a while is is how to uh, we've done really well residentially and we want to keep doing well uh, but how do we extend that to our business districts and uh and kind of uh, take that to the next level with them as well so i think it's it's going to be a win-win for 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 the village as a whole for the for the sustainability efforts and for uh, the businesses um, all the way around so I'm pretty excited to see the, the final final results, but um, we're definitely going to continue to be kind of at the top tier for these programs uh, on the North Shore. Great. And I'd certainly love to get back to um, <laughs> to some alternatives to electricity. Um, I think we all enjoyed when we had the original aggregation for a while. And, miss those benefits yeah it's um 
you know, there's a, a slide deck in there and I'm happy to talk about specifics or even to go through the deck if you like. But in short, um, the first model of aggregation, we were able to find a supplier that would consistently um, deliver below um, ComEd's rate. Um, for a while now, after ComEd, as they should and as we're grateful they did, um, got more aggressive pricing, we haven't been able to deliver a guaranteed savings. And we haven't been able to, uh, to get another provider that'll always save some money for the village um, and for residents, really. Um, and there was quite a lot saved in those first years of aggregation. It was, um, I forget the exact number, I wasn't with the village at the time, but in the millions uh, across just our consortium members. Um, what we're looking at in this 2.0 model is really that, you know, we can't serve everyone more efficiently, but we can serve some people more cost efficiently. Um, it's not practical to give that savings back to um, customers. Um, you know, we originally, we estimated that that savings across the whole village would be somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 10 to 15,000. Um, I think you'll see at the end of our negotiations, we've done better than that, which is exciting, but still not, uh, not a number that can efficiently be given back, especially when some customers can get it and some customers won't. Um, but it, you know, it, it'll make a, at no cost to anyone, um, it'll make a pot of money that can be used um, for other village programs. I know some, of, some members of our consortium will apply that to renewable energy credits. Um, I think the, you know, the numbers we're seeing are very promising. Um, others will apply that to local sustainability projects. Um, I think one will keep it as um, general revenue, um, but certainly free money is, is the moral of the story. And um, I, it's a, a good, good program to get it and a good opportunity to keep um, building on our um, sustainability successes. And the option for, well, there was an option for purchase of renewable energy among possible for the residents, correct? Is that in there as I saw? Sure, so there is, um, as it is, I believe we reported on it um, at your last meeting, so we didn't double dip, but as it is, the village has a community solar program that we've been soliciting residents with. Uh, I believe it was a guaranteed 20% savings on retail rates, which is great, um, a leading program in the state. Um, on top of you know some initiatives we have already, so I'll just note that's available today. Um, there are options for increased renewable mixes um, that may be av made available as as an opt-in for residents. Um, I, I don't know how cost competitive those are. We haven't gotten to that stage of evaluation, um, but certainly that's an option, a, a turnkey option for anyone that would want to increase their um, uh, share of renewable energy consumption. Uh, of course, at additional price, it's a, a modest additional price. Um, Glenn, can you explain why this sort of aggregation is not the same as the Texas power grid, which had a catastrophic failure? Sure. Um, so let me answer um, at the market level and then at the the contract level, if I could. Um, and the market level, I'm not an expert. I'm, I feel pretty comfortable with what I'm about to say. I don't know how much more detail I can give you. But um, in short, um, so where we are in this market um, is a group called PJM Interconnect. Um, so our grid in Illinois also works with grids in Pennsylvania and other parts of the Northeast and power flows uh, among um, those different subgrids within PJM. Uh, in Texas, they have a completely different network in a lot of ways and, and a completely different grid. Um, what most um, entities like PJM engage in is, is what's called a capacity auction in, in one form or another, where basically, you know, you are a, um, you turn on the lights, it uses a megawatt of power, you pay for a megawatt of power, right? Um, on the back end, some of the payment that a power plant gets is um, for the power they actually have to produce. And then they're essentially paid to have power generating capacity available, the capacity auction. So they're paid in blocks, I believe it's one or two years at a time, essentially to have 
uh, a supply of power that the grid can draw on on demand. Um, the Texas grid, I'm forgetting the name, but it is unique in that they do no such capacity auction. Um, all prices are spot. You pay the bear market rate. Of course, that means it's very competitive and um, lower cost energy sources can compete drastically against um, more expensive sources to maintain, but that means that larger facilities may be harder to, to keep online. Um, before the Texas catastrophe, if you would, um, PJM was criticized because it engaged in one of the um, largest capacity auctions in the country. Um, and so it procured a lot of capacity. Um, this picture is from the, and that capacity I should mention tends to be um, more errors on the side of legacy power sources, right? So hopefully clean natural gas quite possibly subsidizes coal um, or is a, a revenue source for coal generating plants. Um, this we go um, was one such, oh, where am I at? Hang on just a moment. There we go. If this will work. Uh, this was one such criticism by the Sierra Club, essentially saying that PJM's, you know, paying to keep plants online that aren't necessary. Um, this is, again, before Texas. This is when keeping this much idle power in reserve um, looked like a really bad idea. And to some extent, I'm sure um, someone sophisticated with this market could tell you a little bit more about it, um, you know, if it really needs to be that much. But what we saw during that, freeze during that event, you know, more energy markets than just Texas were affected. Um, there are markets downstate in Illinois with municipally run natural gas sources that took tremendous pricing hits. Uh, there are energy utilities in, say, Kansas, Missouri, where I used to work, um, that saw rolling blackouts and, again, substantial price pricing issues and, and uh, natural gas issues. PJM to my knowledge, saw little or none of that, and that's in part because of this, um, this excess capacity allows it to absorb um, rare events like that, that spike up heating, cooling, um, energy demands. So um, that's, that's the extent of, I won't even call it expertise, but that's the extent I can speak to that topic. Um, I'll mention I'm actually, um, unrelated to this, putting together um, a speaking session for uh, municipal officials, local municipal planners, things like that, to hear some, from some more expert people. Um, we have Mark Pruitt, who's been working with um, the village for some time. We have someone that's we hope will talk about um, the ComEd uh, Exelon sale and what that means for energy in Illinois. And we're working to get someone that's familiar with the legislative too. So um, trying to educate myself more on this topic, uh, trying to bring more education on an important topic too. Um, as far as this, that's a whole lot of explanation. The other answer is simple. As far as this contract, uh, ComEd's the provider of last resort. Um, if the you know aggregator screws up, ComEd still steps in, still delivers power to you, and then the aggregator and ComEd have a problem. Um, but I know the, the Texas thing certainly has been on my mind. A lot of people's mind wanted to speak to that a bit, especially because the the sustainability ramifications, I hope, are pretty um, pretty interesting. Yeah, they also had, and I can speak to the infrastructure problems that they had, where the actual plants themselves, the, the transmission lines, were not built to federal regulations because they were a state independent source. And as we, as I design buildings and infrastructure across the U.S., we certainly are taking a look at climate change. And we know that those swings in hot, cold uh, flooding um, require for robust infrastructure, infrastructure that is designed to handle that. And certainly uh, through no fault of the village itself, we've seen the same thing on flooding. It's like we used to design to 40. Or even if we design to 100, well, a 100-year event isn't a 100-year event anymore. So um, I think that was a problem that Texas had, too, where they just did not want to, to do some of the kind of robust engineering that would normally be required, burying things at a certain depth, because they just they never expected or never thought the risk was manageable 
that they would see such an extreme in temperature fluctuation. Right. Now that you say that, I remember um, reading that they had been warned a few times um, that these lower temperatures were to be expected. They they would be unusual, but to be expected, and that. Thank you, Brian and Glenn. All right. Um, if there's nothing else on the village staff report, would any of the members like to share any things that they've learned or come across recently since our last meeting in August? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a question. Um, who's risk? I know I get very confusing because there's so many different landowners. Um, near the bike path, but who's responsible for the restoration work? It's so nice to see the buckthorn disappearing. And um, anyway, I wasn't sure who's behind that. Got to unmute myself. That's important. Uh, everyone's got to do it at one point in a Zoom meeting. It's required. Um, are you referring to the uh, Robert McCory bike path, the north south route? Yeah, I, I think. Um, we had a question about this and some of the removal work that was being done right on the bike path um, was uh, is being done by the village. And so that's um, really just as much of a, a safety issue as anything. We're trying to make sure that that growth, um, you know, ultimately we need to eliminate buckthorn. Um, really our maintenance focus there is just to make sure that growth is, is growing in a way that keeps it out of the path of, uh, of cyclists. Well, I would say, um, I mean, it seems like it was more than that. It seemed like a lot was really cleared out sort of by the crosswalk closest to maybe the fire station, I guess. But um, I would say that would be something to sort of make some noise about that, you know, we're doing some restoration and making it um, more environmentally sensitive. Um, because I have heard people say, what is that? And I don't want them to think, you know, trees are being cut down unnecessarily, but instead that it's sort of restoration work. It's an improvement. Right. A number of those were ash trees as well. I, yep. I did note that. But it is, it has come up. There are definite questions. So we can address that. No, I... Any Any other? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, in working okay. for, yeah, really, <laughs> in working with our um, our waste management, do we have any idea within the village the percentage of food waste that we have? In reading about, you know, nationally that food waste is the largest issue, and if so, would it be possible for the village to supply people with um, compost containers to alleviate some of the waste right here at the household level? Sure. So um, we don't have an exact number on how much of our local supply is food waste. Um, we do have numbers uh, at a regional level, and those were included in the last issue of On the Bluff. I think altogether it's in the 20 to 25 percent range by weight. Um, Seems high. It's substantial. It's it's a, one of the larger opportunities we have to reduce um, our landfill consumption. You know, it's one of those things we don't talk about as much as we should probably, uh, and the number escapes me right now, but you know, every few years we study landfill capacity in this region, and you know, I mean, the 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 headroom is measured in, in years, not decades, um, that many of these will be filled and would need to expand. Um, and the more we can take out of that cycle, the better. Um, you know, one, there was, uh, was and is some discussion around um, composting containers. Certainly, um, if you are a Groot, uh, well, if you're interested today, I should say, um, you can call Groot. They will give you a container that you can rent for I think it's $100 a year or something if you'd prefer to do that instead of um, those brown craft bags. Um, that's not an option that's going away in the next contract. Um, we, you know, one of the things I think we looked at was 
tweaking that, making it a requirement. But you know, one of the concerns was, um, you know, we know that not everyone may want a third to have to find room for a third container, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, that was um, still a, an option for anyone in the village that's interested. Or you can again use those um, craft paper bags. You can put it out with your um, landscaping waste too. Chicken. Or a chicken waste. Puppies. <laughs> so I have um, one thing that I know um, Sophie has seen, uh, and I mentioned it um, to Sue Raymore, has posted on in the through Facebook on the Lake Forest Lake Bluff News Group, um, that she wants to start a book group for anyone concerned about pollinators, um, birds, bees, butterflies. Um, she's proposing uh, a book club to read uh, Doug Tellamy's Nature's Best Hope. Um, she is. She set a date tentatively for Saturday, May 15th, and I reached out to her and I said I'd mention it, but um, there is a lot of interest. I checked in again this evening. There were a number of people from my street who are interested, so I think that's a great, a great sign. Um, open land people look like they're interested, but um, you know, great, great opportunity to collaborate and get to know your neighbors a little bit more while we all work together on this. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, co-chair reports, Marina? I have, I have none, specifically. Okay, uh, nothing for me either. Um, can I get uh, then um, a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Roll call. Certainly, Member Bishop. Aye. Member Sorensen. Aye. Member Twishell. Aye. Co-Chair Hurrier. Aye. And Co-Chair Renner. Aye. The motion carries and you are adjourned at 759. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. It's good to see you all. <laughs> it's good to see you too. Bye. 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 Bye.